Chronologically speaking, this is the last scalar QED tree-level differential scattering cross-section calculation that I intended to add to my quantum field theory lecture series. Pedagogically, it isn't the last or the first, meaning that the order that they appear in in my quantum field theory lecture series won't be with this being the last, but it's the last one I got around to finishing. The calculation is pretty simple, partly because it's at the tree level and partly because the Feynman rules for scalar QED are a bit easier to handle algebraically than for many other quantum field theories. The approach is the standard using the Feynman rules on the tree-level Feynman diagrams for this reaction, where the Feynman rules are as I gave in my introduction to scalar QED video earlier in my quantum field theory lecture series. And of course, once you have the Feynman rules, you can immediately see what vertices are possible, and therefore very quickly you can write out what tree-level diagrams are possible for a given reaction. Now, all of this work is aimed at calculating the exact scalar QED analog for the more famous standard QED tree-level perannihilation result. So we're going to use the same parameterization for all the momentum vectors in order to make them directly comparable. This is what's usually done in quantum field theory textbooks. Now on an unrelated note, I'm trying out a few format changes in this video. First, I'm going back to a bit more sparse writing in the document. I'm not conveying less information in this video than I would normally. I'm just doing it more with spoken words. My hope is that that makes the video more enjoyable to watch. The other format change I made is there's a little rectangle in the upper right corner where I recorded through my webcam so that you can see me present even though it's a screencasted math video. Hopefully that also makes the video a bit more enjoyable to watch. Now this is my first time screencasting like that. Hopefully in future videos I get it to be even better. Regardless, let me know what you think of the format changes. Let's get started. To refresh your memory, this is the Lagrangian density of scalar quantum electrodynamics. We have the standard electrodynamics part, but we have this modified U1 gauge invariant scalar Lagrangian instead of the U1 gauge invariant Dirac Lagrangian as we would find in normal QED. Of course, the way we get the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian to be gauge invariant is the same as with the Dirac Lagrangian in standard QED. Specifically, we use exactly the same gauge covariant derivatives, but because this term here has two of them, we don't just have an analogous but different in form interaction term to the one we see in standard QED. We actually have a second one, a completely new interaction term that has no analog in standard QED that gives this two scalar boson to photon vertex function in addition to the, in some sense, more normal two scalar boson one photon vertex function, which is the one that does have an analog in standard QED. Now, if you want a better review of the difference between standard QED and scalar QED than that, and then I refer you back to my introduction to scalar QED video, which I've linked to in the description. Now, as I said in the introduction, the goal is to calculate the tree-level differential scattering cross-section for perannihilation in scalar QED. This is a calculation that has a very famous analog in standard QED, so it's useful to do the scalar QED version of it so that then at some point or another you can compare. Now, the basic process here is the standard process for the most common version of perturbative quantum field theory. We have these three Feynman diagrams here, which given the kind of interaction terms that show up in this Lagrangian, are the only possibilities at the tree level. And we also have these Feynman rules, which I also discussed in that video on introducing scalar QED. Now, I haven't included quite all of them. I don't have the photon propagator in this table. These are specifically the Feynman rules that we need to evaluate just these Feynman diagrams. What we're going to do then is we're going to use these Feynman diagrams and these Feynman rules to write out the Feynman amplitude. Then we'll come down and use this formula here to get the differential scattering cross-section from it. At least that's the general idea. In practice, we do have a bit of extra processing that we need to do with this formula here before we're ready to even start messing with the Feynman amplitude. Some pre-processing to get the specific general formula that we need to plug the Feynman amplitude in to get the standard result. Coming back up to the Feynman diagrams, we can see I've labeled the incoming and outgoing momenta and polarization vectors. The momentum vectors are the ones we're interested in right now.
now if we plug in the momentum vectors that are relevant to this problem into this formula to make it more specific we get down to this result here where I've used this function argument notation to indicate what differentials this d sigma still depends on because that'll change as we proceed through integrating over some of those variables. With the momenta specific to this problem inserted in we can proceed to actually processing this differential scattering cross-section formula into the result that we're looking for. The desired differential scattering cross-section that we are looking for isn't just any old differential scattering cross-section for perannihilation. It's specifically the one that's analogous to the more famous result I was talking about in standard QED so that we can compare. And that differential scattering cross-section is with respect to the solid angle of one of the outgoing photons. Now there are two outgoing photons. We can pick either one. It doesn't matter. I happen to pick K1 just because it's first. But regardless, we have four other momentum variables that we need to integrate over in order to be left with the differential scattering cross-section just with respect to the solid angle of one of the outgoing photons. Now three of those four integrations are super easy to do, the ones over these differentials, because of the three mechanical momentum conservation delta functions that show up in this formula here. Doing those integrations just gets rid of that differential and leaves us with this mechanical momentum conservation relation, which we need to take as truth throughout the rest of the calculation because of that delta function that we integrated over. Unfortunately, the fourth of the integrations that we need to do isn't quite so straightforward. It actually isn't over specifically one of the differentials that's left over here. As I said previously, we want the differential scattering cross-section with respect to the solid angle of one of the outgoing photons, and this doesn't make that solid angle differential very explicit. So we can't just integrate over one of the remaining variables and have the differential scattering cross-section that we're looking for. We need to change to spherical coordinates to reveal the desired solid angle differential, and then we can integrate over the momentum magnitude differential that's left over. The transition to spherical coordinates is done by inserting the usual spherical coordinates volume element, and it definitely does reveal that desired solid angle differential and the remaining variable that we need to integrate over. So pulling out the solid angle differential that we don't want to integrate over, and then integrating over the rest, leaves us with this. I also pulled out some extra stuff that definitely also doesn't depend on the variable we actually seek to integrate over. Now this is almost as easy as the first three integrations because there is still a delta function to help us, but it's not quite as simple. And the reason why it's not quite as simple is that the argument of the delta function, this bit there, isn't as simple a function of the variable that we're integrating over. Luckily we have an identity to rescue us with this more complicated delta function integration. Specifically we have this famous delta function identity for precisely this application. It tells us that when we have a delta function of a non-trivial function of our integration variable, we can easily re-express that as a delta function whose argument is the integration variable minus the root of the old argument divided by the absolute value of the derivative of that argument. This of course makes the integral really easy to do. The delta function just sets all the integration variable dependence equal to the root of that old argument and then divides it by this quantity where after the integration it too is evaluated at the root of the old argument. Now I'm not going to prove this identity here but it's quite a famous one. You've quite possibly seen it already. Also you can see that I've distinguished the integration variable from the root with this subscript not which will be redundant notation after we've done the integration because the integration variable will be gone. So what we can do here is we can insert this in do the integration and then drop that extra notation in order to make the rest of the calculation maximally easy. Doing that gets us to this and then we can evaluate what this derivative is. It ends up having that value. At this point it's actually a good time to introduce the parameterization. Exactly when it's optimal to do this varies from scattering calculation to scattering calculation. In this particular one and in the standard QED analog of this calculation it turns out to simplify the the calculation the most to introduce the parameterization now. Now the parameterization used in the standard calculation, and therefore the one we'll use here, is the one where we take the rest frame of the initial charged scalar, which works out to correspond to this parameterization. This vector is easy, 
The rest of it we need to use for momentum conservation and trigonometry to figure out, but it's still straightforward, and it's exactly the same parameterization that we used for the standard QED version anyway, so you're probably familiar with it. With this parameterization, we have these results for the desired dot products and this momentum magnitude, and that yields this value for the F prime function that we want. If we insert that value into the differential scattering cross-section as we last left it, we end up with this. We can then insert this result for the momentum magnitude that we need and that other dot product that we need and simplify and we get this result which is actually the final answer. So now we have the differential scattering cross-section with respect to the desired solid angle and on top of that it is simplified down as much as we can before we know the Feynman amplitude. So now we need to work out the Feynman amplitude. If we take a look back at that table of Feynman rules and the Feynman diagrams we see that the first one gives this contribution, the second one gives this contribution and the third one gives that contribution. And of course the full Feynman amplitude at the tree level is just the sum of those three. Now if we recognize that photons are transverse we see that these two terms are actually zero and therefore the first two Feynman diagrams actually don't contribute anything at all. We are therefore left with this result for the Feynman amplitude which is exceptionally simple. It makes our lives easy. The modulus squared of the Feynman amplitude therefore is this and if we insert that into the differential scattering cross-section formula that we spent the vast majority of this calculation simplifying down, we get the final result that we're looking for. This right here is the standard result for pair annihilation at the tree level in scalar QED. And it does look a bit different than the result in standard QED. And seeing that is kind of the point of doing this calculation. And so with that, we are done. So now you know how to calculate the tree level differential scattering cross section for perannihilation as given by scalar quantum electrodynamics. It's a straightforward calculation. It's really a delightfully simple calculation given that it is a calculation in the subject of quantum field theory and it gives a rather pretty result. Sometimes even the difficult subjects give you a nice freebie like that. Hopefully this video was enjoyable and interesting and helped fuel your interest in quantum field theory. If it did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Dietrich out.